Well, hello. Hopefully you, hopefully you guys can hear me. Hi, Sasha. Sasha, great to see you uh, online. I'm hoping you can hear me okay. I've had some <laughs> issues with sound, which is usual. And um, also, just as I was setting up here, my whole easel went for a bit of a loop. So I'm hoping this is clear enough and you can see that. Um, let's just do this. Hi. <laughs> um, all right. I see someone here from Amsterdam. Anne, it's great to see you. Germany's here, Amsterdam. And another, oh, let's see. Okay. Hi. Hi. At least I can hear you. Is that, hi, Baron? At least I can hear you. Um, can you guys hear me okay? <laughs> I hope you can. Oh, dear. It's been interesting trying to set all of this up last minute uh, because everything just kind of fell. And so there it is. That's the joy of going live. You never know what's going to happen. Um, hi, Andrew. Um, let, let me know if you can hear me okay. That would be great. Uh, hopefully it's not like just a mess of sound. I've had so many... Okay, thanks, Anne. Do appreciate. Thanks, Rita. Great to see you guys. Uh, wow. Uh, you know, painting is supposed to be something that, like, just kind of comes easy. You pick up a paintbrush and away you go. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter um, what you do. You just kind of, if, if it's not working, you walk away, you come back to it again, and you fix your mistakes. But when you're going live like this, it's um, just insane because um, last minute there's always something happening. I'm really glad you guys can hear me clearly. I've had problems with the internet signal and I've also had problems with my mics. As you know, um, any of you who have been watching this regularly, it seems like about the only thing I can't get working is um, my live streams. But anyhow, here we are. Great to see you. Uh, today is a really interesting subject. It's one of my favorite subjects. Um, I, I, you know, talk about this a lot with my students in the classes and in my private lessons as well. Uh, and this is all about uh, focal point. And uh, there's a big question around, you know, what is focal point? Um, and, you know, how do you make a focal point? How do you, how do you determine where to put it um, uh, in your painting? And, uh, so again, it's a huge subject. I don't want to spend like hours and hours going through this because there are lots of variations uh, as far as, you know, which focal point comes first because you can have a primary focal point, a secondary focal point, and so on. Um, you can make one area of your painting more important than any other area. And I guess the question is, why would you do that? Um, if, you're, if you're trying to paint something and, and keep uh, someone involved, in your painting. You want them to keep looking at your painting. Um, you want to make sure that you have uh, an area that's of interest, kind of a focal area. And um, uh, when I say focal area, I guess I should be really clear about what I mean. If you, for example, at home right now, in your studio or wherever you are, if you are to look at something across the room, doesn't matter what it is. It could be a book on a shelf. Uh, it could be a painting on the wall. It doesn't matter. And look at a, a specific detail in, in that object that you're looking at. You'll notice that everything else is out of focus. It's, it's peripheral vision. So you cannot look at everything in focus like a camera does. A camera looks at things in focus everywhere until you get into depth of field, of course, and that's another issue. But even looking at me right now, if, if you look at one eye, the other eye is out of focus. You, you can't look at them both uh, at the same time and have them both in focus. Um, and that's because we triangulate. So whatever we're looking at, we actually uh, are looking through two optical devices, you know, one on the left and one on the right, unlike a camera, which looks through one lens. So when we're looking at something, we triangulate. So both of our eyes have to come to a point 
uh, that we're looking at. And our brain puts all of that information together and we see that thing that we're looking at in focus. So how does this relate to our painting? Well, one of the things that I see, and I see this regularly, and, and I'm sure you do too, um, there are a lot of artists who like to take a photograph and reproduce the photograph in paint. Um, so they copy the photograph. That's what they do. Um, the, the thing is that it's not the way we see. We don't see everything in focus. The camera sees everything in focus, but we don't. Uh, we only see the thing in focus that we're looking at, that specific area. And of course, it's very impressive when I see, you know, someone who can actually copy a photograph and do it really well and even enhance the colors and maybe eliminate some areas that aren't as interesting. But when, when everything is precise and in focus through the entire image, our eye has to keep moving around all of the time in order to understand, well, you know, what it is we're looking at. And we, we put all that information together very quickly. It doesn't take long to compile the information. If it's a, a you know, photograph or, a, sorry, a painting of a car, we know what it is. And if it's all very precise, we know what that is, or a building or a tree or whatever that is. So one of the things that really struck me, you know, going through uh, galleries in Europe in particular um, when we were there, um, is that... Some of the old masters, and I'm going to use Rembrandt as, as an example. Rembrandt had this incredible ability to um, deal with peripheral, the peripheral vision, the things that are outside of the focal area. So if you look at a Rembrandt self-portrait even, you'll find that one eye, for example, will be in more detail than the other. In fact, he loses the information in the shadow areas a lot. Um, <clears throat> And maybe there's a sharp line, you know, on the edge of the nose or, or on an ear. Uh, uh, um, uh, Soroya did the same thing. Uh, and uh, actually, Ender Zorn is an interesting guy to look at because when you look at his paintings closely, I remember, uh, you know, being with Stefan. I think it was, we were in Munich and we were looking at um, an Ender Zorn painting. And... Uh, Zorn seemed to put focal points or sh into different parts of the painting to keep your eye moving around the painting. The subject itself, which was the center of interest in some cases, didn't have the techniques to create a focal area um, uh, necessarily. So that's really, really fascinating to me. You know, why would he do that? It just seems kind of crazy. Like, why would you you know, put your focal, uh, these focal areas around the painting and not have it in the center of interest. So this is something that you can do as well in your painting. As I thought about this and as we looked at it, I realized that what he was doing was having the viewer move around the painting and keeping them involved in the overall painting. It wasn't just like, wow, here I am, this is a simple subject. Here, um, I want you to look at me and now it's time to move on. That's not what he was doing. He wanted you to take in the whole scene, and he did this by creating various focal areas or focal points um, within his painting. So it keeps you kind of moving around the painting. Um, so I'd like to show you uh, some simple techniques or some simple ideas or, or rules, if you want, on how to create a focal painting within your work or create more than one focal point in order to keep the viewer engaged with your image. If the viewer looks at it and just gets it all right away, it's boring. Uh, at, from Maybe I should speak for myself. I find it a bit boring if I look at a painting and I say, okay, that's very nice. It's a great street scene and I can see the lights and, you know, there's a car and whatever. Um, it's, it's great to look at, but then it's done. The story is done. It's it, whereas if you have if you involve peripheral sight, which by the way is the majority of our sight, uh, most of what we're looking at when we're looking through our eyes is peripheral vision. If you think about it, if you're looking at a very specific thing, something in the room around you, everything else that major part of your vision all the way around is still there. You can you can see stuff around it 
you know, I'm actually standing in my studio right now. I'm looking through a doorway, but I know that there's an easel here and I know there's a bookcase here. I, I can even kind of see the ceiling above me and the floor below, but I'm not looking at them specifically. I'm not directing my eyes towards those areas. My peripheral vision is active and informing everything around what I'm looking at specifically. It's letting me know that, you know, you're, you're here, you're safe, you're in your room and you know, the floor is there. It's not, hasn't disappeared. Um, of course we know, uh, other things through gravity, through the other senses that we have, but our peripheral vision is very, uh, uh is a critical thing all the time. It's active all the time. And we, when you're walking down a sidewalk, for example, if there's a sudden change in elevation, supposing, you know, there's a stair or supposing there's a crack in the sidewalk, we're aware of that through our peripheral vision. We, we, we become, you know, quickly aware of it. Something has happened, something has changed. And so we, for just an instant, we'll look at that. We may even bring it into focus for an instant and we can bring our eyes up again to see where we're going. Um, to know whether it's safe or not. Do we have to be more careful? And if you're climbing, like if you're out in nature and you're, you know, climbing through the mountains or you're climbing a path or even if you're skiing, um, you are very much aware of what's going on with your feet. Because if you're not, you're going to fall or something could happen. You could end up in a hole somewhere. So your peripheral vision is critical to your safety. Um, when you're looking at a painting, your peripheral vision is important because it determines all the stuff that's going on within the painting, uh, but your eye is drawn to certain areas specifically. And if an artist uh, controls this properly, uh, they can keep you involved in the painting. So that's the idea of this. Um, I'm just going to say hi here. Hi, uh, Heike. Nice to see you. Uh, Ina, nice to see you. Bernd, of course. Um, and Rita, I think this is really, um, this is great to see you guys. Um, uh, Rita, this is an interesting comment. I think that not many people are really looking at a painting. Many are so superficial. Um, you know, this is interesting to me because I think, um, when you go into a gallery, you know, if you're a painter, you're an artist or you're a visual person, we tend to spend more time looking at an image and trying to understand it. You know, I, I think it's just in our nature to do that. I find as a painter, um, I want to look at the brushwork. Uh, I want to see how they put that color down or, you know, is it a glaze? Is, is it more opaque? Um, uh, you know, you know, what are the colors? Do they work together? So I tend to spend a little time analyzing paintings, maybe a little too much time, but, um, not to, you know, take away from the enjoyment of the painting. If a painting grabs you, if it gets your, you know, gets your attention, um, well, maybe you want to spend some time with it, really looking at it and trying to figure out what is it about that painting that, that is really keeping me here? Why, why did that have an impact on me? And I find that the paintings that have areas that are not resolved completely are the ones that interest me more. Uh, perhaps that's because it allows my intelligence to get involved. And, you know, I, I can figure out what's going on here. I actually don't. If you look at the Night Watch, if you look at uh, Rembrandt's Night Watch, um, as an example, the lower areas of that painting are so obscure. You know, there are legs and arms and things down there, but we're we're drawn to the face. We're drawn to the faces, the portraits of the people who were paying him to be in that painting, and we don't really notice so much what's going on below the portraits. And it's no mistake that he painted this way. Uh, he did this on purpose. Uh, he wanted us to look at their faces. He wanted us to look at the people within the painting. But all that other stuff supports what he wants us to look at. It's just not done in as precise a detail. A lot of it's in shadow. And of course, Rembrandt was famous for his lighting. So, um, I really, um, I really want to show you 
a couple of uh, ways of creating these focal points, because I think it's exciting to, to use this in your work. Um, you can get people to look at things within your painting that, you know, you want them to look at. Um, you know, if you're, if you're doing a still life and it's an apple, a pear, and an orange, and you want them to look at the pear, um, uh, I can show you the way to do that. So um, let's get on with that. I'm going to explore these ideas. And again, if you have any questions while I'm going, I'm happy to answer. I'll check in on the comments uh, now and then just to see. Uh, okay, so I'm going to zoom over here to this kind of abstract, you know, mush setup here. I've just thrown some color down onto a canvas here. And I want to show you uh, a few things here that are kind of general rules, I would say. Um, ways of, of creating um, uh, attention, getting attention in a certain area. Uh, and um, it come, there are really basically three or four, I would say, uh, very simple concepts, very simple ideas that you can use to get people to look at a particular area in your painting. Now, right now, this is still a little wet. If I just take my brush and I just soften everything down here, this is just a kind of a wash and a bit of paint on here. If I soften everything down, I'll just do that first. And I can see my phone is shaking around a little here. That's the other thing I have to remember to keep touching my phone so that it doesn't get kicked out of the stream. That does happen now and then. So I'm hoping it won't today because I've got the internet working better, but it, it crossed my fingers. I shouldn't say too much. All right, so I've created, you know, a lot of soft kind of color going here. It's kind of a, it's actually a, a lemon yellow, um, yellow ochre, a touch of yellow ochre. I've got a rublev um, uh, cypress burnt umber, and I've got a bit of ivory black in here as well. So that's my palette today. I'm not going to go crazy with too many colors, although I may introduce one or two just to get, show you a point. All right, so right now there's lots of soft edges. Um, nice to see you, Irina. Thanks for showing. Uh, this is great. Great to see you guys. Uh, okay, now my eye right now kind of goes to, I don't know about you, but my eye kind of goes to this area right here um, because it's a little darker. Um, and my eye also goes here a little bit as well. Uh, it's kind of a larger, colorful, more colorful area. Um, you know, it's not very well defined. So my eye can move around this. Maybe my eye even goes up into this area here. If I don't want you to look at that area, if that's if that's my plan, then what I can do, uh, let's just see if we can make this work. I'm going to bring in a little bit more, uh, a little bit of uh, color over top or beside this. If I want to, if I want you not to look at that area, well, it seems kind of simple. I just get rid of that area, right? Now you're looking at a bigger area right there. And maybe this one's getting more attention now. If I want you to look back at that area, I'm just going to do something here. I know how to do that. Now I know exactly where you're looking. Your eye may be moving around the whole painting, but I know you're looking at that because it's different than everything else around it. Now that sort of seems to make sense, you know, it's like, well, okay, you're not telling me anything I don't know. But why is that happening? So I've got a darker value here against areas that are lighter in value. That's one way of creating a focal point. So value change. I'm just going to put these things in a little more crisp right there. Value change. Uh, that's a critical thing that you can use in order to get someone's attention. Now, I can have a value change with soft edges. That's still going to get your attention. Or I can have a value change with a, a crisp edge. Now, let's just see what happens here. I'm going to put a sharp edge right here beside it. And now I know that you're looking at this first, and then you're looking to this one second. 
So how does that work? Well, um, when you're when we're growing up, uh, you know, as children, we learn that uh, sharp edges are dangerous. Um, we learn that pretty quickly. You know, if you watch little ones, little children, you know, they walk into the edge of a table and it it's sharp and it hurts them, and they suddenly realize, "Ow, that hurts." Um, it's a sharp edge. Uh, parents tend to keep their children away from broken glass. They're sharp edges, and they can cut you. Um, uh, sharp edges hurt you. So we're always kind of trying to preserve ourselves. We're always trying to look after ourselves and make sure that we're not hurting ourselves. Sharp edges are something we pay attention to. A sudden change, for example, if you're walking down some stairs, uh, you know, those edges coming down the stairs are sharp. They're not round. If they made round stairs, we, we'd all be, you know, sitting on our butt uh, in a hurry. They're sharp edges, and we have to make our way down, and we have to pay attention to them. And in some locations, of course, they even put um, a, a change of color on that edge. And maybe that color is, well, let's just say that color is a bright yellow. Okay, so we've got now a stair with a bright yellow. Let's see what this looks like. Now I really know where you're looking. Okay, um, we, have a, we have softer edges here. We're not looking over here so much anymore. Our eye comes to this because there are sharper edges and now there's an intense color. And not only is there an intense color, it's beside a darker value. So really, what we're talking about with focal area is almost all contained right here. Um, sharp edges get our attention. More intense color, more chroma, that gets our attention. And changes in value. So if you, if you wanted to write that down as a list of things um, that create a, a focal point or a focal area, you can pretty much guarantee that that will do it. Um, sharp edge, change in value, most intensity of color. Um, and of course, the more contrast there is of, uh, of uh, value, the more attention you're going to get. Um, let's just do something here. I'm going to grab a little bit of white, and I'm going to put it right here. And now I have this really interesting scenario where, well, now my eye is going kind of back and forth between these two things. Um, we're, we're looking at the, the more intense color, but our eye is also drawn to that white spot which is a big contrast in value. So this is where it gets fun, because you can play with these ideas. If I want to bring your eye back to this area here, all I have to do is reduce the intensity of that white. Let's just see if I can do that by dragging it down a little bit, softening the edges on that, uh, that uh, white. My eye is still drawn to it, because it's such a big change in value. But as soon as I do this, you can see my eye comes back to this intense color right here. So you can really play with these things to force people to look where you want them to. Now, in all of the time we've been looking here, you probably haven't been looking down here in the corner, bottom left-hand corner. And you probably haven't been looking up here either or maybe not even down here, although there's a little more chroma or a little more color here. Maybe your eyes drawn down to that area a little bit. You're probably not drawn to this area up here. So if I want to move your eye around, what happens if I, if, if I want to move your eye down to another place? I'm just going to do this. And I've got, this is a cadmium red that I've got going here. So now I've got, you know, a, uh, a bright yellow, the cad yellow, and now I've got a cadmium red, and your eye is moving back and forth between these two now, and maybe you're looking at that a little bit, but really you're paying attention to these two right here, the red against the green, the yellow, brighter yellow against that same green background. Um, which one is more important? Well, this is something that's worth thinking about. If you have a painting 
where all the focal points are equally as important, then you start to lose your audience as well. So you, ideally, you want to have a primary focal point, a secondary focal point, and maybe a tertiary, or maybe you even have four or five focal areas within your painting. If I do, I'm just going to do this, and let's see what happens. I'm going to soften that down a little. And I do that. Yeah, my eyes are drawn to that, but no, I keep coming back to this one now. Yeah, it's, that's important. I want to be aware of that. But I also keep coming back to this one here. So you can really keep moving the viewer's eyes through a painting this way. Um, why do we do this? Again, it's because we want them to stay uh, uh, involved with the painting that you're doing. If you, if you have a painting that's resolved everywhere, then they're done. You know, they know, they know the story. And, and you have to be careful also with putting focal areas too close to the edge of your painting. Um, when I say that, um, there are some artists who do this very successfully. Um, and, and you can make it work. But when you do, you have to be careful that you don't take them out of your painting. It's sort of like, okay, I've seen what I, what I need to. Here's the focal area. Now it's time to move to the next painting. Um, I find sometimes I'll go into a gallery and I'll stand in front of one painting for, you know, five minutes and just, or maybe even 10 minutes just to try and understand what it is that they have done, uh, to keep me involved. And if you look at Rembrandt's painting, of course, the Night Watch, it's a massive painting. It's huge. There's a lot to keep your attention. And there are a number of techniques that he's used in order to do that. Uh, there are other ways of, of keeping uh, someone's eye moving around, and I'm gonna. This is very simplistic. I'm just gonna show you something. If I want to keep your eye within a painting, I'll use uh, something that is a very old classic way of keeping your eye in a painting, and that is the idea of a triangle. So if I do this, I know that your eye is going to move around that. You have to be careful your triangle doesn't get too close to the edge of your painting because that might just be an arrow that takes them out of the painting. But as soon as I do this, I know that I can keep you, I can keep your attention in, in this painting. So let's, let's do a primary, a secondary, and a, a, a tertiary or a third focal area. I'm just going to soften this down. And because I want to use kind of the same idea everywhere, I'm just going to take the same colors and put them on all three corners here so that they look almost kind of equal. And let's see if we can make um, one of them stand out, the next one stand out a little less, and you know the third one even less again. So I'm just going to pick one as a primary, uh, primary focal area or focal point. Um, to do that, I'm going to bring in, well, the sharpest edge. So I'm just going to go into a darker color here. And let's just do this. I'm just going to use my palette knife right here. Okay, already I know that your eye is going there over those two. Okay, I know that. Um, well, let's, let's do it this way, actually. This will be kind of fun. I'm going to, I'm going to do the same with all three. So I'm going to put in a, a dark zone there. And I'm going to put in a dark zone here. Okay, so now it's more like a pattern, you know. Our eye just keeps moving around those things. That's fine. But I want now one to be a little more important than another. So I'm going to change the value and bring in a little more color on one of these here. Let's just do this. I'm going to put a yellow in here. Now guess what? my eyes going to this one. And all I did was put a little bit of color right there and make it a little lighter. Um, that's, that's okay. You know, now we have sort of a primary, that becomes our primary focal point. And the other two are kind of secondary to that now. But what I want to do is have a focal area that really says, bam, look at me. I really want you to look at me. So instead of using such a pale, um, sort of, uh, well, it's, it has more contrast, certainly. But what I want to have now is 
a color that is really intense and light against that dark and warmer because that's another thing you can use warmer color to get a, to get a, a focal area to happen so let's just do this now well there's a dilemma okay I've got I've got a slightly darker value but I've got more intensity of color my eye tends to be drawn to this in you know so there's a little bit of a fight going on between these two you know which one's more important that one or that one if I want to be sure that one is more important then maybe I have to involve another color or even more intensity of color let's just try it with a straight cadmium uh, yellow and let's see if that will do it okay so now this one has more interest because there's more going on in it nice sharp edges and I'm going to do something else I'm going to increase the contrast in this one just a little bit more I'm going to bring in an ivory black right here I'm going to make that a little bit darker not doing a good job of that hang on and I'm going to do one other thing I'm going to create another value change and a focal point that's different from these I'm changing the pattern so I'm just going to do this and as soon as I do that I know where your eye is going to go we keep looking down to that but you know this one is a little more exciting now because there's something different so we look at things that are that are different as well if there's a change of rhythm or pattern and that's another important thing to discuss I'm just gonna get rid of these now and I'm gonna show you how that change of rhythm or pattern works hopefully this isn't too noisy for you guys all right so change of rhythm or pattern let's see what that looks like and these are there are a number of different techniques by the way uh, that you can play with in order to create focal areas or focal points um, right now this is just a mess of paint if I want to uh, let me just grab I want to create a pattern here I'm just gonna grab a q-tip and create uh, I'm gonna pull away color that's what I'll do so I'm just gonna uh, take a q-tip I've dipped it in thinner paint thinner and I'm just going to create a pattern taking the paint away of course you know leaves a bit of a, a lighter color here the stain behind as soon as I do something like this A change in pattern I know where your eye is gonna go because we look at things that are different what has happened here it's like a picket fence or something where one is off kilter it's leaning it's on an angle it's more exciting uh, anything that's on an angle is more exciting um, that's why perspective is such a great way to get your eye into a painting um, if I wanted to accentuate that difference even more well I can go into color again I can bring a little more color into that make it a little lighter a little brighter a little more chroma in it you don't see that very well on the screen let me just get another a little more intense color so you can see that better okay so I can do that and I really do know where your eye is going right there and that's fine but even within pattern we can work with this idea of changing um, the rhythm and making someone look at another area so I'm gonna bring in some cadmium red on this one as well I'm gonna put it in a different area and let's just see what happens now but and this is really not great because you're getting a lot of um, a lot of reflection here unfortunately let me just tip this yeah you're still getting a lot of reflection my apologies 
Um, okay, maybe what I'll do is I'll do this with white instead. Uh, let's let's just do this over here. Okay. Now I know that you know that's this this has become a primary because it, it's so different from everything else that's down there. All the color behind it. This is kind of a secondary, even though it's on an angle. I mean, we're going back and forth between those two, and that one might be a third, even though it's a cadmium red. Uh, so. Uh, again, change of rhythm, uh, change of value, and a different shape against another shape will continue to uh, draw the eye uh, into a painting. Um, these are these are really fun things to play with. You could literally, you know, give yourself like twenty different exercises with the same shapes. So, if you were to take, for example, a circle, a triangle, and a square, um, and and do 20 paintings practicing uh, different colors, different values, um, and different uh, arrangements of them to see if you can actually force the viewer to look at a specific area. That's a really great exercise to do because it's not just focal point at that stage, it's also compositional. Um, you know, where can you put a triangle uh, so that it looks less important beside a, a circle or a square, that type of thing. Um, okay. Now, I want to do a painting uh, today using this idea, uh, changing focal uh, areas. And I'm, I'm going to attempt this um, in a, with a very limited palette. Um, Underneath here, I have already arranged, and I'm hoping this whole thing doesn't come crashing down like it did before. Let's just see if I can do this. Okay. You can see underneath here, I've prepared another canvas, or actually panel. Sorry, just as I thought I was going to be okay, I cut out. Um, I've been having some trouble. Oh, man. Um, okay, let's just see what this looks like now. I'm going to have to move this slightly this way. So sorry. I hope that you can hear me all right again. Let me know if you can't hear me. Or Well, I guess I can ask the question, can you hear me? Um, Maybe that's a better question. I'm back. Thanks, Ann. Um, my stupid phone, I don't know why it does this. I touched the screen hoping that it would just keep it active, and maybe I did something I shouldn't have. Well, obviously I did. Okay, so what I have here is um, a panel with an oil-primed, uh, it's oil-primed uh, gesso uh, ground, and... Um, the paint on top, you know, will stay slippery for some time. So that's one of the nice things about working on an oil primed uh, panel, uh, because it's very slippery underneath, and I can paint oil on top of it. Um, I was really inspired when I saw a scene by John Singer Sargent of um, Venice, and of course, you know, he was brilliant with what he did. Um, I'm going to attempt to do something with, again, with a very limited palette. Um, I want to attempt uh, a scene and use these, concept, uh, these concepts of focal area. So in order to do that, I'm going to use my Rublev and my uh, Cadmium Lemon. And I'm just going to block in areas where I'm, I'm going to be, I'm drawing from my iPad, which is above, which you can't see. Um, and if I try and move everything right now, you might just lose me again. So I don't want to do that. Um, I'm just going to start drawing in the scene. And uh, it's a street scene, and I'm going to, there's a little lady who's walking down the street. 
uh, and I should probably shouldn't tell you. You should be able to figure it out by the time I'm finished. But here we go. I'm just going to start painting here and drawing with the brush. One of the things that I love about the way Sargent dealt with his painting was that I'm quite fairly certain that he worked into a wet paint background, very similar to what I'm doing right now. And he could bring in the values that he wanted to uh, by softening uh, edges and taking away paint where he wanted to. And I'm just quickly going to draw. Um, I can see that my that everything's pretty fuzzy over here. So uh, whatever happened, uh, again, it may be my internet connection has slowed down a lot. I don't know. Um, but hopefully you won't lose me here again. If you do, I will come back. Um, I'll, I'll finish the image and uh, post it on Facebook. Uh, I'm really disappointed with the way this connection has been working recently. So anyhow, you're seeing all kinds of peripheral stuff right now. It's very fuzzy. Okay. Um, I'm looking right now at just trying to get shapes down in the right places. And these um, create kind of a rhythm, if you will, uh, in, in the scene. Um, and I will attempt to paint something that's recognizable by the time I'm done, hopefully. And all I'm really using right now is a bit of the, that Rublev and a little bit of the cadmium uh, yellow light or lemon yellow just to get a feel going here that that is really freezing up isn't it that image i'm watching i'm watching this on the other screen and it's really really slow and fuzzy uh okay don't know why it's doing that okay i need stefan here or someone else who knows something about all this technical stuff to help me out because I'm and I've done lots of reading to try and sort it but I'm starting to think it might be our provider I'm gonna blame them instead of my poor technical abilities okay um, now I'm just gonna draw or when I say draw, I'm drawing with a brush. You know, I'm just trying to get as much as I can in here uh, to get a feel for, for the overall scene, for the basic shapes and the basic values that I see playing in here. And I, I like working this way, you know, wet into wet painting uh, because it gives me lots of nice soft edges. And again, a very limited palette is what I'm working with. Um, it looks sharp for you guys. Okay, that's good. Thanks, Anne. Maybe what I'm seeing on my iPad is different than what you guys are seeing. It's very possible. And this is a soft brush that I'm using. Um, it's just a synthetic brush. And again, a very limited palette. I'm letting the, the colors behind here start to peek through here and there and identify themselves. I just want to get my values working. So values are critical, you know, to your painting. If your values aren't working, at least with this kind of painting, if I was painting impressionistically, then I would let color do more of the work. Uh, but this way here, um, I can let... Uh, I can just use my darks, my lights, and, and go back into them where I need to. There's kind of some kind of window going on up in here as well. And because this is Venice, and the walls are all kind of crooked, um, you get away with a lot. You can make something look like Venice fairly easily without having to have everything straight everywhere. Just a few things have to look right. <clears throat> um, I do like the way 
you know, these colors kind of glow through. Um, it's, uh, it's fun when you work with uh, transparent. This is quite transparent, this color, by the way. And it's, it's fun when you work with transparent colors because you can, um, you can see the color better and you get a sense of looking into the shadows more. I've got a little more opaque color going in here, but I need to get these values down because this whole area is in shade. So while I'm painting away here, uh, one thing I was thinking about earlier today um, is, you know, I'm really happy to be doing this. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. And I really enjoy the feedback. I enjoy your comments. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, you're learning some things and I'm showing you things that, that are helpful. Um, I do this for free. Um, I haven't, I've never charged for this. Um, I know that there are some artists that do, and, and of course we all need to make a living. That's fine. But, and I've never asked anything of anyone here within this course, as far as I know, I haven't said, you know, like I can't do this anymore because I'm not getting paid or any of that nonsense. Um, but what I would like to ask you to do, if you don't mind, uh, as a favor, if, if you're willing to do this, I would really appreciate if you wouldn't mind passing the link on to other artists or other people who you think might be interested. They don't even have to be artists. Um, give me a thumbs up if you like what I'm doing. I do want to keep doing this. And when I see the comments and I get encouragement with people subscribing, it makes me want to do it. It makes me want to do it more. And um, again, if you're enjoying it, I enjoy it. I like to paint and I'm doing this because it's fun for me too, to be fair. If you never refer me to anyone, I'm still going to keep doing it. But when you do refer me to others, then it does uh, increase my subscription, uh, the number of people subscribed. And um, for those of you who have been watching, I know some of you have actually purchased some of my paintings. Um, as a result of these. So that is a side benefit for me. In fact, five paintings uh, just, uh, well, today, I think today, uh, they're supposed to end up in Austria. And I'm very happy, you know, to have made some sales this way. So it does promote my work. I do appreciate that. I've had several other sales as a result of what I'm doing here, um, in also in Canada. So um, again, really do appreciate if you pass it on because that opens up um, the door for other people who might be interested in my work and might want to, to buy a piece. And if not, even, even if they're just watching so that there's some interest in what we're doing here, they can learn from it. Especially younger people who, you know, they're taking courses that are pretty expensive sometimes and... The stuff that I'm showing here is stuff that I've learned from other people who have shared generously with me, and I do like to pass it on. Um, so it's that's all part of the program. I won't say any more about that right now. Okay. So I'm just trying to get these values working. This is certainly no Joan Singer Sargent. But it was definitely the approach that he took on the painting that inspired me. Nice to see you here, Jerry. Um, another fellow Torontonian. This is great. Um, all right. Um, now I'm going to try and take away a little bit of color here and there, just to lighten it up in a couple of areas. If you're wondering how does this all relate to focal point, well, right now I'm using shapes that are bringing your eye. This is another compositional technique. Of course, of course, with perspective, your eye is brought into this area here. And I haven't got to the subject that I'm, that I'm really going to paint, which is uh, the focus will be in this little area right here when I'm done, hopefully. I want to lighten my color up a little and create more texture um, in the wall. 
And when you have the option of taking paint away like this, it, you know, it leaves a stain of color behind, but you end up with these nice textures. Now there's a whole big laundry line in here, which at this point in time, I'm going to leave out. Maybe I'll paint it in later, um, after the live stream. I'm not sure. Well, I'll play that by ear, but I do like the kinds of textures you can get when you paint this way. I can go in with a smooth brush. I'll just do that. Um, I can find one. I, I can go in with a very soft brush and I can take some of the texture away if I want to, or I can add different textures to it with the smooth brush. So you can really control the paint this way. It's a nice way to work. Highly recommend you paint wet into wet. It's a lovely technique. And of course, when it's dry, you can go and add more detail when you want to as well. So I can really soften areas down with a soft brush like this. And this is just a dry brush I'm using. So um, in between uh, passages of, of the brush on the surface, I can also just wipe it off on clean paper towel. That gets rid of some of the color and I can create some nice textures even by tapping sometimes. You can get nice soft transitions of color that way as well. Okay. Uh, there's quite a dark area, cast shadow area that I need to put in near the bottom now. And that comes across this way. So this is an important zone right through here. That's really dark, probably too dark. I need to lighten it just a little bit, which I can do. When you're painting wet into wet like this, it's easy enough to do that. And there's this kind of interesting shadow that falls from a roof line of some sort that's to the right in this image. It's filling it in, looking at it somewhat abstractly, um, you know, looking at the shapes and trying to see this somewhat abstractly. Where the, the light comes, or where the shadow comes to the light, I can soften that edge just a little bit so that it feels more believable. So we get the, I think they call it the penumbra, if I'm not mistaken. This area that just gets a little lighter. Okay. And I do want to lighten the shadow more. Now again, I'm seeing a really fuzzy image on my iPad. Um, I'm hoping it's not that way for you guys. Let me know if it's really fuzzy, please. Um, cause I won't, I won't keep going on this if it's just not fun to look at. I'll paint more of it, uh, in my own time. So I've got a doorway here. Um, one of the things I'm really looking forward to now that things are starting to open up a little bit is getting outdoors and painting outside. Um, as the weather gets better and as we're able to go further afield, um, it's exciting to know that we can actually get outdoors again. So highly recommend painting outdoors when you can because um, you see light better that way than any other way. Uh, you see color that way better than any other way. Uh, practicing outdoors, it forces you to paint quickly and just get on with it. Don't, you know, don't fuss with things too much. Um, you learn more about painting when you create an impression of what's in front of you and then later on, if you want to add more detail into something, by all means, you can do that. Uh, 
I'm squinting at the image that I'm looking at and trying to replicate the values that I see. Again, values are so important. You want to get the right light, right dark, in the right places. That's the challenge, always. I'm not being too careful with all my edges here. Uh, they're fairly soft because, again, I'm thinking about peripheral, right? We talked about peripheral. I don't need to have it all in detail. I can allow some soft areas, especially where it comes out to the edge of the painting, where I don't want you to be looking there too much. I want you to be looking towards the, the, the focal area, which is a little lower below here. Um, okay, I need to bring a little bit more, uh, there's a chimney that's going on in here somehow. I'm going to put that in. Uh, this is going kind of green, and the reason for that is because I'm using cadmium yellow, sorry, cadmium lemon, and, um, and ivory black. And of course, ivory black has a lot of blue in it. So it gives me a very specific green. Uh, and a lot of this is sort of towards the green, the chroma of green, this painting. If you watched me painting uh, the dog uh, a few series ago or a few times back, um, it's a similar technique. Uh, painting wet and wet like this. Now I've dipped my paintbrush into thinner. I just did that. Didn't mean to do that. Um, so I have to make sure I get a lot of that thinner out of my brush if I want to paint in a dry brush way. So I just, when you do that, just be aware of what you're doing. Keeping things soft. You don't want to take too much paint away. You want to leave just enough and you can keep working this as much as you want to to create the textures you're looking for. Um, I'm going to go into a slightly darker tone here. Actually, I think I should go into a slightly darker tone down here. That's what I'm going to do. When I look at the values in my photo that I'm working from, can afford to be a bit darker down in here. And up here, it's not as dark as this, so I can take some of that away, but it is darker than this area above. So always trying to relate values to each other, that's important to do. You know, squint at it. If in doubt, squint. Um, when I say squint, just close your eyes down a little bit so that you don't have as much color information, you have more information about how light and dark things are against each other. There's a lot of little brush strokes going on here, which I don't usually like to do. I like to keep them bolder, but I like the textures that are happening because it feels a little bit like Venice that way. Um, I haven't used any violet in the shadow. It's uh, a good question. Rita, not in this case. Um, so it's a great color to work with in shadow, though I do like using violet. Um, so a um, bit choppy uh, for you, Andrew. While well, you're watching England versus Scotland, that's got to be way more exciting than watching paint dry. <laughs> Who's winning? Um, I haven't been paying attention. All right. Uh, I'm going to bring a palette knife in now because I want to get a few little edges that are more crisp. Uh, and maybe this is the time to introduce the, a little bit more chroma in the focal area right down in here. I need a little bit more light. So I'm painting more opaque at this stage. Make sure I've got good, clean color to start with. Pick it up with a palette knife and just put it in here. 
and maybe down the side of this door right here. A few little details. Sometimes it's all you need just to get the attention. And that's almost a bit of a false light. It's almost a little too bright. Uh, so I have to watch that. I have to be careful I don't, don't do that too much. Um, I'm also going to bring out a Q-tip and just see if I can lighten that door frame up a little without getting into painting it a whole bunch. It's another nice way to add a lighter value without you know, adding paint all the time. You can take paint away. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think I can use some of that around this window here as well. Don't have to paint, you know, take paint out in the whole area, but just enough to say, you know, there's a window there. Again, we're looking at peripheral and focal areas. That's something that I keep thinking about. You know, where do I want, how do I want to bring the eye through this painting? Uh, so let's just do, bring in some perspective line here. And this is a case where I'm using the palette knife which gives me very crisp edges, but I want to go back and, and you know, soften that down a bit um, so that it's not too, too much in your face. So I will do that. I'll get a softer brush to do that. How's our time? 3.03. Okay, here it's 3.03. Uh, I can take my palette knife now. I can soften things with a palette knife. So I can do this kind of thing. I know that sounds kind of looks kind of strange but then when I go in with a soft brush I can work that back and I get some nice textures happening in the wall right there so let the let the paint work for you you know some of those textures can be soft you don't have to have it all in detail um, I think I want to bring a little bit more texture into this shadow, this area down in here. It's actually a darker wall that has shadows in it, uh, but also a couple of windows in it too. So I'm going to put those in as well. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Um, you know, this, this yellow that I'm using, um, I stole directly from Sargent's uh, painting. I match, tried to match it. I was trying to figure out how did he get, it's a street scene. I should maybe feature that along with, well, maybe I shouldn't feature it along with my work because it'll just make my work look awful. But anyhow, it's, it's a, a street scene from Venice. And um, I tried using yellow ochre and the yellow ochre was just a little too, uh, wasn't intense enough, needed more chroma. So uh, I ended up using this cad lemon, cadmium lemon, and I really like it with the ivory black. And I figure he's used something very similar to it. I was fairly careful to match uh, the color when I did this. Now, the center or the focal of this whole painting um, is hasn't been done yet. So I'm just going to do that. I'm going to take away a little paint here, see if I can get this right. So it's going to go in right about here. Let's just see. I have to get my proportions right. Okay, let's try about here. One of the things about creating focal point also is that you can frame a focal uh, area. So you can use frames within your painting in order to create something that uh, um, you want people to look at. 
So I'm just going to go in here now. And I'm just taking paint away with a Q-tip again. I need a fresh Q-tip or two. I'm using a little bit of thinner as well with this so that it takes it away more easily. And this is a very, this is a good example of a shape changing and a break in rhythm. So we know what all is going on here, but we want to be able to create something of interest. That's what all of this is about, is to, to bring this little area into some kind of focus. Hopefully when I'm done, this is gonna make sense. I may need to go into it later and just be a little more refined with it, but I'm hoping that I can get the idea across this way at least. Okay. This is where I need a fine brush. I don't want to get too picky with it, but this is where I need to be just a little more precise. And I can go into this here, just bring some of the values down so that they're not too intense. And the other thing I want to do, I'm just going to go around this shape. It's a little too high. Right there, so a little darker color. And I also want to bring in a color. So like a different color. So that should make this stand out a bit um, if I do that. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, a super bright color. It just has to be a different color than anything else that's within the painting. So I'm going to bring in a bit of a blue. I'm going to try that and see if it works. Like so. And I also want to refine. Um, I want to refine the colors a little bit around. Well, by now you probably figured out this is a person. So, around this person. I probably will have to go into this later just to bring up the detail a little more because this is getting a little fussy, but you're getting the general idea here. A little more intensity in that blue. And I want to, you know, I think I can even bring a bit more color into the top of this individual here. Let's just see what I've got here. I've got a couple of other colors out here just in case. Okay, this is a bit of a lizard crimson now. And it's funny when I look at it. It's like a very distorted looking little figure. Okay. And I'm going to give this person a little bit of a contrast right here. And I will work on that a little more later when I want to get into being fussy because, uh, you know, it just, it needs it needs the focal area there to work properly. Um, okay, what I want to do now is I want to bring your eye more towards this area, if I can. Um, 
And one of the ways to do that is to bring even more light into this area here, uh, into the ground. And I'm just going to take paint away now. Let's just see how this goes. For sure, this brings your eye down to that zone. I'm just taking paint away. It's leaving a stain of color behind. That's all it is. And this really says, you know what? I'm the focal area now. I need to clean my brush properly. Got a little bit of blue in that. And make sure that I've got the crisp edges where I need them. And soften down this area in the front of it. Maybe I could use a little more light back in this area so when you're when you're trying to evaluate what you you should and shouldn't be doing it's really important to get back from your work and i'm not able to do that very well because i'm up close to it right now so that you guys can see what i'm doing and i can see what i'm doing but um later on i'll i'll take this a little further uh by getting back from it you know getting back from your work gives you a better view of the whole painting at the same time that's the idea so you're not getting too hung up and too fussy with things um, i think i could bring a little bit of that light even into the wall area here but maybe not as much so let's just create a little more texture up in here and all of these things should be bringing your eye down towards this the this zone right here that's the idea I like seeing different textures happening in these areas so that it feels like the textures of 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 Venice Uh, sometimes I'll get a rag in there and just, you know, um, a soft rag and pull more color off, soften things down, keep these textures working. So none of them become more important than the focal point. They all lead to the focal point. That's the idea. So in, in the whole discussion today, um, this was about focal point, how to create contrast and value. Um, to create a focal area, sharp edges. Um, so keep your sharper edges towards the focal area, most area of contrast, more intensity of color, all of those things happening in one place. And I'm certain I know where you're looking. I know that you're looking here. Um, those other things are interesting and they bring your eye to this, but it's almost a pattern of larger to smaller and the perspective and all of those things draw you into this little zone right here. And that's the whole point of today's uh, program. I can e even do something like this where there's a little hint of a light. It's not in the photo. There's a hint of light coming down through this zone here. A little bit softer but that gives me an idea that, you know, there's more activity, more going on here. And I also want to bring a little more light into the wall area here. Again, our eyes are drawn to light more than they are the shadows. We, we're just naturally drawn more to light.
All right, we're at 316 now, my time. Um, I think for, you know, the lesson today, this is probably about as far as I need to go. I'll spend a little more time on this uh, in my own time, and I'll post this as well. And again, uh, any of you who have been watching, if you feel like it's worth seeing this stuff and you're enjoying it, please pass it on to others. Just pass the link on or refer it or, um, you know, share it. If you're on Facebook, if you want to share this, really do appreciate that um, because um, I think there, there are a lot of courses out there and a lot of people doing things. And I'm not saying that mine's necessarily any better than anyone else's. I know it's not. But there are things that I've learned that um, I enjoy sharing, and I know that my students uh, use a lot of these techniques and these ways of working to make their painting stronger. So please, I'd appreciate that. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, hopefully it's in focus enough. It looks better now on the screen. Okay, that's good. Um, uh, thanks for showing up, and thanks. Um, I'm glad that you, sh you showed up today. Um, please be safe. Enjoy some of the freedoms that we're, we're getting right now. And um, uh, I plan to keep doing this. I'll see you next Friday if, uh, if I don't see any of your comments before then. Um, uh, really happy to, to, uh, to have you folks showing up. Uh, let me just come back to you. I'm just going to, again, say sharpest edges, the greatest value contrast, the lightest light and the darkest dark, and the most intensity of color. Those are, those are three basic things that will work for a focal point or a focal area. And change in rhythm, change in pattern. So that's something that will get you there as well. So um, try it. Uh, get out some paints and, and, you know, give yourself some exercises. See if you can make this work. You can do it as simply as taking like a round ball in a box or something and, and put some light on it and see if you can move the viewer's eye around that painting. Ask your friends, you know, which part of the painting are you looking at? Um, which part doesn't work for you? Sometimes it's the areas that don't work for you that you need to deal with, right? Or someone else, they're looking at it and saying, well, I'm not really sure what's going on here. So um, gradually working with this idea more and more, it'll feel comfortable for you. And um, it's a technique and a way of working that uh, will strengthen your paintings in the long run. Allow the peripheral vision to be part of your image. So thanks again, everyone. Um, I'm seeing more comments, great. Um, uh, Berndt, Sasha, uh, super and Heike, nice to see you. And okay. Uh, be well, stay safe and we'll see you next Friday. Take care. Bye.